Welcome everyone to Classic Metal Class Session 20. And this time it's going to be a bit more philosophical, I think, although we're going to do a lot of uh, delving into music history to use examples, because what we want to talk about here is uh, it's, a, it's a topic we've brought up before. Who counts as an original or founding member of a band? And then we'll also look at the question, why do we care so much about this? Why does it give somebody a kind of cred to be part of uh, the, the origin of a band? And as it turns out, it's, it's a way more complicated issue than we would at first think of. And it, it came up recently because Rudy Sarzo, the great uh, bassist, uh, Scott and I were just talking about all the different bands that he's played in, um, you know, best known perhaps for Quiet Riot, but he was an integral part of White Snake, um, Blue Oyster Cult. Um, we were naming uh, Ozzy, right? That's right. He played with, well, early on with Ozzy, right? Yeah. yeah he was, he was one of those people who was poached uh, by the Ozzy organization let's call it yeah and so um rudy sarzo has rejoined quiet riot uh so this is his third time being in the band and well actually fourth time if if we if we count it in in certain ways and there have been a lot of interviews with him about well why are you rejoining what's going on and he got asked a question whether he considered himself to be an original member and we're going to look at some of the things that he says. And I think there's actually a good case for calling him an original member of the band. I think some of the things that he said are pretty on point. Uh, I'm not sure where you're on that, Scott, or where anybody else is, um, because technically he's not a original founding member of the first Quiet Riot, but there's more to the picture. And, and as we started talking about this, Scott and I realized that this is way more complicated than we originally thought because there's all sorts of conundrums that arise. Well, what if a band breaks up and reforms like Quiet Riot did or like the Scorpions did, or as we're going to talk about Iron Maiden did and Judas Priest did, who counts as an original member? So there's a lot of distinctions to explore. Um, I think we'll start out by, by looking at the Sarzo situation, as we're going to call it first, because it provides such a great case study. But Scott, is there anything you wanted to say before we jump into reading these, these excerpts? Yeah, I think just one of the things that came up in us talking about it was um, there's, there's original in the sense that they were in the band first, but then, you know, well, wait a minute who is in the band when the, the band took off for their first huge album? Is that something we should consider? Yeah. Um, or, uh, you know, we were talking about, um, well, even take a band like the cars, Elliot Easton wasn't the original guitar player of the cars, but he was on every record that they put out. Right. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, um, we have to consider you going back to the bar band version of it where they played covers or, right. they, you know, are you, which, and this is, you know, what you said, it became incredibly complicated because you and I kept hitting back and forth. Well, wait a minute, what's the criteria? It's not so simple, I don't think. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to address these point by point. We'll start with Rudy Sarzo, obviously. You know, uh, something that I haven't asked you about, but now it occurs to me I should to, you know, exploit your background and talents. This question of originality, um, is this more of a a fan and like critic kind of issue or do musicians care about this a lot? I mean, would musicians care? Like would, would somebody like Rudy Sarzo care if people weren't pestering him with questions about this? <laughs> Does it matter from, from like a musician's perspective who the original members are? I, it depends on the situation because I mean, we know that like when Jakey e. Lee joined, he just said the fans used to give him the finger and, mm. And, you know, we're talking about, well, you know, okay, the, your choice is Ozzy stops making music because Randy's gone. Um, you know, I one time, when I was 18, I joined a band that was doing really well in Boston and I replaced their original guitarist who was a wildly different player than me. And they wanted to start like this, you know, new thing and they already had some hits, if we could call it that. But um, but then we became our, our own thing. Was I the original original? No, but I was on a bunch of the 
songs of that whole era that like you know we kind of toured that stuff or played that stuff so yeah i guess you know someone like gene simmons well actually he you know there's that big debate where's ace freely where's peter chris where's um you know i you know i think it depends on the situation you know i think a, a band or, or a group of musicians will do what's best for the band then you know if people can't like sticks is a great example dennis DeYoung can't get along with jy and tommy and um and then we just hear the blame game going back and forth i don't you know because yeah, they're yeah. asked about it i think you nailed it because people keep asking dennis are you ever going to go back dennis would you go back dennis you know or you know why aren't you getting back with dennis or you know and and you know they're asked these questions and i don't i don't know that's a a band of that level or, or maiden or whatever the, the the fans will have their opinions i guess right yeah but what yeah i guess what we're getting at here is well what you know if we really don't go from a um, completely emotional you suck you're not the original guy <laughs> you know uh <laughs> we don't go for that knee-jerk emotional reaction what do we come up with actually yeah yeah I mean, that's an interesting topic, the resentment that people sometimes feel when either a musician has died or a musician has stepped away from the band and they've been replaced. There's this largely irrational demand that, first of all, the, the past not have it, you know, included this, this terrible event, right? Everything should be going on as normal, but also the expectation that the new person should um, conform to like they're they're you know they're stepping into somebody's slot not their own slot right so i mean the jk lee um randy rhodes thing is a just a perfect example because two quite different kinds of players yeah, right very um and and they both put out really great albums um each of them got two albums with with ozzy mm -hmm. but they're very different sounds you know yeah i mean um we know that Randy wrote a lot of that stuff, you know, and it was apparent that like, like Dire of a Madman, he was studying Leo Brower pieces because he was starting to study classical and all that stuff sounds, it, it sounds like Leo Brower pieces. Yeah. You know, like the guitar parts. Um, and then Jakey e. Lee ended up coming out and saying, you know, I just want credit because I wrote a lot of that stuff. I don't want the, I don't need the money. I just want them to admit I wrote it. A perennial problem with the Aussie organization, isn't it? You it know, I, I actually, so a good segue into the interviews, because one of the things that I did find in interviews that was kind of interesting, speaking of Randy Rhodes and what he contributed to, to Ozzy's um, uh, Blizzard of Oz originally, and then just Ozzy Osbourne, is that he brought a bunch of Quiet Riot early Quiet Riot material. And since he thought the band was essentially defunct, he repurposed like riffs and fed them into some of the, the Ozzy songs. So, oh, oh here's yeah. a good point from, from Mark. Uh, an important point to consider is financial. There's a distinction between the practical and legal origin of the band. Yeah, what does the contract say? And some of the people who weighed in about that, they're like, listen, I signed a contract. I'm a founding member. Rudy Sarzo is a good example of that. Um, that doesn't necessarily touch upon the authentic identity of the group. And it's often a sore point of contention for band members and, and fans. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll the, the contention, there's some stuff with the Sarzo uh, and, and whole quiet riot thing as well. So let's jump in. So in this blabbermouth interview, um, earlier he, he Sarzo said, I'm returning home, going home to quiet riot at the beginning of 2022 next year. And he says, uh, next year marks 50 years of my journey with quiet riot, because that's when I met and started playing with Frankie Benali, another founding member. Now here's where the, the important terminology came up. Another founding member of the metal health version of the band. So Sarzo was never saying, I was there at the very inception. I'm an original founding member of Quiet Riot, the one that put out Quiet Riot 1 and Quiet Riot 2. I'm a founding member of the metal health version of the band which, you know, for many of us was the definitive Quiet Riot. I didn't even know that they had previous albums until I, I didn't started either. looking them up. Yeah, yeah, like a decade ago. So um, now why, why did Sarzo come back? So he says, um, you know, Benali was dying of pancreatic cancer and Sarzo got to spend a lot of time with him. 
And uh, Benali's wife, Regina, told Sarzo, Frankie wanted me to come back to the band. He wanted to have a founding member there in the band. So this is sort of respecting, you know, the last wishes of, of somebody else who's arguably a founding member of that as well. Not the original um, drummer, as we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. In the Metal Voice interview, um, this is a video uh, interview. Sarzo was asked whether he considered himself an almost original member after replacing Kelly Garney. And so he said, when you say almost original member, that would be like saying Frankie Benali is not an original member of Quiet Riot. Let me give you my perception. This is the way I look at it. There were two albums that were only released in Japan. It was basically kind of like releasing an independent EP. 45 years ago, when those records were released, the Randy Rhodes version of Quiet Riot, Billboard magazine, they didn't even have a chart for that. Nothing for imports or music that was record, released in Japan. If you don't have a record deal in the USA, you got nothing. You are not a recording artist. So technically, the clock starts with metal health because that's when a band under the name Quiet Riot got signed to Pasha slash Columbia Records. I got a contract. I signed along with Carlos and Kevin and Frankie. That disputes the fact that I am not an original member. So a lot of stuff going on there, right? And this goes to the thing that Mark had raised about, well, who actually signed the contract? Um, now, I think this is a really good consideration. What, what, what do you think, Scott? That it's essentially like releasing an EP, not an LP. Uh, yeah, well, I remember that, you know, back in the day, you'd go to, well, in Boston, there's Tower Records, and they had a small import section. And you were lucky if they could, even Tower Records, as big as they were, if they had an import of somebody. So, I mean, and I I, I guess I still, well, you know, those, those days are kind of gone like that, but it's not like... Um, that's true because things are just released everywhere now, right? Things, yeah. So yeah. back, you know, back then, I don't know. I mean, if it wasn't if it wasn't released here, you didn't have a contract. You didn't have distribution here. So he's he's right about that. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, Mark brings up a great point because if he was if he penned the the American, not only is that the definitive album, but you know, mm. if if he penned his signature with the band as the, you know, the, the first band releasing stuff here. Um, I remember when that came out, that was a new band to me when the, that album came out, you know, right. You're right. on the radio oh, and that was all just of like, us. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think, I think he's, I think he's nailed it. And, and, you know, I, that, that whole quote about him saying, you know, the clock starts here. I agree with him. I, you know, he makes a good point. So, would you go as far as to say that, I mean, he's using some pretty careful language, you know, um, founding member of the metal health uh, version of the band, um, original member, at least in terms of when things are released. Do you think that this, I mean, it, it would be confusing to say that he or Frankie Benali are original members per se. Because then you'd say, well, what about Kelly Garney? Um, what about um, Randy Rhodes? What about what about these other people who are not in the band by the time that mental health is configured? Well, I remember, you know, going back to the time, uh, maybe it was just from Circus or or whatever magazine. Yeah. Um, I you know it was I, even though it's like, hey, do you know that Randy Rhodes was actually in Quiet Riot? we thought that was a fun fact, but we didn't consider him, <laughs> you know, like we, he yeah, was yeah. Guitarist, you know, and quiet riot. It was kind of like, even I could go to my, you know, when that album came out, even reading all this stuff in the magazines, that was a fun fact. But I, I, I said, well, you know, this is kind of a new band that he must've been in early when they weren't doing anything, even at the time with that information, I didn't say, Oh, so Randy's an original founding member. No, he was like, the Ozzy guitarist, even yeah, so I think even, although he was an original founding member, although he was originally, yeah, but like yeah. you know, he moved away from the band to join Ozzy, and yeah, then why wasn't he on Metal Health? We knew Carlos is the guitarist, um, yeah, that's that that's an interesting way to put it. So, here, here's another thing from uh, Metal, the Metal Edge interview. 
Um, he said, I don't know if people know this, but during the last break that Randy and I had from Ozzy, we were hanging out with Kevin Dubrow, as we always did when he came back to LA. And he said, listen, do you guys mind if at some point I rename Dubrow as Quiet Riot? Now, the backstory to that was there was a Quiet Riot, right? They released Quiet Riot 1, Quiet Riot 2, toured a lot in the LA scene, were kind of rivals to Van Halen. And then Randy Rhodes leaves. Um, uh, Rudy Sarzo was the replacement for Kelly Garney, where, you know, there were incredible personality conflicts between him and Kevin Dubrow to the point where Kelly Garney actually had a loaded handgun and was going to kill Kevin Dubrow. <laughs> so band <laughs> problems. So, you know, Sarzo joins. And then uh, Randy Rhodes gets poached essentially by Ozzy and Sarzo follows him. And then the band breaks up and, um, Kevin Dubrow is the band leader. So he's running this thing as Dubrow. So then he's asking them, do you mind if I rename it Quiet Riot? And so Sarzo says, of course, Randy said, yes, gave him his blessing. So did I. It was kind of in the works about a new version of Quiet Riot, even when Randy was still with us. So this is a second part of the the story. Um, and, and there's some important considerations I think we should, you know, bring up. Scott mentioned already that, you know, th this is as far as we knew us dumb metalhead kids in the 80s. Um, <laughs> this was the Quiet Riot. And Sarzo himself appeared in the music videos. Yep. Um, that was massive in the early 80s. Um, he toured with the band until 1985. Um, metal Health was the first heavy metal album to reach number one in the Billboard Top 200 Albums chart. So that really was a massive impact. And right now you can say that Sarzo is the only classic member of Quiet Riot's current lineup. I mean, it would be possible perhaps um, for like Carlos Cavazzo to come back if the, the current guitarist wants to go away, but there, you know, Quiet Riot is a band this came out in the interviews too, that was marked by incredible personality conflicts. Um, you know, Dubrow and Garney couldn't get along. Um, apparently uh, Carlos Cavazzo and Frankie Benali didn't get along. Um, uh, Kevin Dubrow also had problems with uh, Rudy Sarzo. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. It's kind of hard to hold a, a super group together when, when people can't get along with each other. But um, I mean, you, you could possibly potentially see a reunited quiet riot with two of those, let's call it metal health founding members. Uh, yeah. In it, you know? Um, yeah. I, you know, in this case, um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, I guess part of the test here is, you know, just to bring up again, when we were like dumb kids in the eighties, like that metal health, album that was the band right what right. happened before was you know touring local clubs or being a regional band you know um yeah that and that's it they were an la band you know right they were, they were not going band. out on massive worldwide tours or anything like that as as you know the the configuration that was doing the worldwide tours was kevin dubrow um uh, Carlos Cavazzo, uh, Frankie Benali, and, and Rudy Sarzo. Which is curious because here, here's an interesting point that I'm thinking of. If the first two albums were available in Japan, I wonder if you could buy those records at the merch booth at like the Whiskey when they played or at the Mint. You know, it's like, I wonder if they had those, they were, because I know in the 80s, you weren't allowed to sell your album at the merch booth because the record companies wouldn't let you. Oh, well, how would they get their hands on it though? But that's what I mean. You mean the fans? Yeah. I mean, the, the, so they're playing material from the albums that the fans can't get. Well, how would how would even the band get the albums from Japan over to LA and then be able to sell them at the merch booth? You know, I, I well, you know, you know, I'd have to know, I'd have to know like what deal they signed because that's, yeah. that would be a little weird that you're playing clubs but you can't, you know, if, as a fan, say you love the first one. They yeah. say you wanted that album and you can't go to the record store and buy it. And you, you know, this is something that we haven't looked into at all, but I'm, I'm willing to bet there are probably a lot of bootlegs of quiet Riot of course. out there, you know, but you know, it goes to say like they were, they, I guess, because we don't, I mean, I didn't know anybody with a copy of those. And um, yeah, I guess it's, it's safe to say that they were a local band that didn't have pro even, even have product to sell at their shows. 
Not yeah. that they didn't make it. No. But before we talk a little bit about now getting into the more philosophical stuff, I do want to say that that Rudy Sarzo on on Twitter actually weighed in <laughs> on this several times and uh, retweeted um, something that I had to say. And then on his retweet said, out of respect to the Randy Rhodes version of the band, which I was the second bassist of, um, Kevin, Frankie, Carlos, and I regarded us regarded us as the metal health version of, of Quiet Riot. So, you know, reiterating his his standard line, which I think is is quite right. And I think at least in that respect, he's completely correct. You know, um, mm. there is a metal health version that yeah. is the definitive version of the band for all intents and purposes. And there are founding members, you know. So let's let's talk about these terms, right? We've got a couple of them floating out there. We've got original, and that seems to have a couple different meanings. Founding overlaps with original, but um, might have a little bit of a, a, a more narrow meaning. Um, then there's this member of classic lineup that you see used a lot. And I think that's you know much more important these days when there's you know decades sometimes intervening. We can talk about essential member, somebody being you know not an original member but being an essential member of the band. And so we're going to get in. How can a, how can a human being be essential to a band? We'll we'll have to get into that a little bit. Yeah, um, I think there there's good reason to use that that terminology. And there's other there words is. floating around out there too, right? I mean, referencing the metal health version, that's sort of like saying classic lineup. Yeah. Actually, yeah. They do overlap, but um, essential, that needs to be on there because if we're talking about the person that writes the riffs or the the songs. Yeah. You know, we would say, um, forget the fact that he's a band leader, but Steve Harris, for so many ways, he's an essential (laughs) member. You know, his sound, you know, his bass playing, and he contributes most of the classic writing. You take him out of the band. I don't know if I want to buy that album. Yeah. I, and I, I kind of think band leader in the sense of like a Steve Harris or a Lemmy or um, I mean, who else comes to mind? Mick Box for um, Uriah Heep. Um, that's sort of like original member squared, you know. Um, it is because actually. they have so much agency in, right. in, in what the band looks like um, and sounds like, I guess you could say. Well, that is a big thing. The individual sound, um, the, the individual, like, you know, um, as far as the contribution to the, the, the sound of the band, you replace this person, the whole sentiment's going to change music. Yeah. Well, and especially if that person's also involved in production. Yep. You know, so like Steve Harris coming in and saying that doesn't sound right in, in, in the production area, he's going to have a hell of a lot more weight than say Nico McBain brain coming in and saying, yeah, I don't like those drums there, you know? <laughs> well, you know, and, and I always go back to the Kansas, you know, the band Kansas. Um, okay. Richard Williams is the only original member left. Everybody else has retired or passed away. And, um, you know, so he's got this whole band and they're putting out a new Kansas album. They always ask, well, you didn't even, you weren't even a writer in the band. And, you know, and so how is this a Kansas album if you're the only member and you're not one of the writers? He said, well, I've been in Kansas for 50 years or whatever. I think I know what a Kansas song sounds like. I mean, that's, that's, that's nice to say, <laughs> but you know, you don't, you haven't written one, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, he wasn't, I mean, with all respect to him, cause he's, he is, an, you know, he's an important member of Kansas, but I don't know if, I, I think, you know, I didn't buy that album, right? I didn't okay. buy the one that he, I mean, he's out promoting it, right? So um, this is interesting for Mark. I'm not sure how to better phrase this, but the question to ask is which member holds the vision of what yeah. the band is together? I actually like that, the vision of what the band is. I mean, Scott and I in the past have talked about ethos, um, a band having a particular ethos, but but I think that word vision or there might be some other closely connected words that that fit that as well, you know, where you could you could say this this is what so think about early Iron Maiden, right? The Eddie is involved in it. That's part of the vision. Songs about um, uh, 
culture references, war, history, um, you know, that's part of the vision. The two guitars playing off of each other sonically is part of the vision, but it's also something out on the stage, those two guys like standing next to each other <laughs> playing, right? That's part of the visuals. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, that could change, but I think as long as it changes within the artist view so it's like you know like i guess when yeah when, like, when art maiden went into somewhere in time or judas priest time, turbo right well in turbo i mean we had a shock but it was the it was the real people saying we're gonna try this out yeah um, but you know i i don't i don't know if we would have given it a pass if it was like not rob rob halford and kk if they were replaced and then all of a sudden the band had a a, tur a an album like turbo put out turbo i don't know if we would we would be angry rather than disappointed. <laughs> like, well, there were plenty of, there were people who were angry at turbo when it came out and somewhere in time, you know, <clears throat> what's with yeah. all this synthesizer stuff, you know, the music has become soulless. People were saying, <laughs> I remember. And, you know, that was like, uh, we have new technology. Let's, you know, let's use it, which, which follows, yeah. you know, it around, but, you know, it came out in the wash because um, they didn't continue on that path. I mean, some of the stuff on Ram It Down had that sound, but that's because they recorded it back in the Turbo that's era, uh, like the title track, Ram It Down, or not Ram It Down, but um, Blood Red Skies, you know, very much a synth-driven song. Right. So, yeah. but, you know, very heavy. I mean, it rivals the Sentinel, I would say, for heaviness. Um, I don't think it gets played that often in, in concert set lists, but. And oh. I think I've I think I've seen it once. Really? Yeah, wow. I think so. But let's let's go back to, to the, the philosophy stuff. So original member, right? If we want to be strict, literal, perhaps even pedantic about this, then there's only one way to talk about it. You're you're only an original member if you were there at the inception of the band as a unit. And and maybe it has to be the band that's named that band, you know. So like um Don Dockin, his band had a different name uh, before uh, it switched to Dockin. Uh, maybe you only include the people from the Dockin, you know, name era onward. And the odds are like, well, like Scott was saying, that whatever band you're talking about was probably just a local band at that time. So, um, you know, if we're talking about Van Halen, it's... Uh, LA if we're talking about sticks Chicago right it took them a while to break out of that that environment and for some of the bands this isn't really much of an issue because they've had such continuity so you know who are the founding members of KISS we all know right um, Gene Simmons Paul Stanley Ace Freely and uh, um <laughs> I'm suddenly I'm seeing that the cat and the blanking, kitty cat, yeah. <laughs> blanking on his name um uh, uh, saying Beth um, yeah, um now you've got me oh boy this is what what a confusion right um but so you could think about that or you could think about like Black Sabbath who who are the you know original members of Black Sabbath you know it's the the guys who are on those first albums because the band didn't change a lot over time you could say that with Motley Crue, right? They've they've had um, a couple shifts, right? So they they changed singers at one point. I think it was what John Karabi um, replaced Vince Neil, um, but now they're back together and it's it's the original band, right? right? So that's easy, right? But if we're thinking about Quiet Riot, then it's got to be Randy Rhodes, Kelly Garney, Kevin Dubrow, and Drew Forsyth. So it wouldn't include Carlos Cavazzo or Rudy Sarzo or Frankie Benali. The only original member of the band who is still there in the mental health era was Kevin Dubrow. Um, Deep Purple is an interesting case in point, right? Because oh, God, yeah. so it was this guy, Rod Evans singing, um, who's definitely not Ian Gillen. Um, Nick Simper on the bass instead of Roger Glover. And then, you know, the three of Richie Blackmore, John Lord, and, and Ian Pace. And so Ian Gillen's not an original member, um, nor is Roger Glover by those, by that definition. Yeah, I mean, but the, I keep going to the extreme case, Ringo Starr's not the original Beatles drummer then. 
well, that if we applied this criteria, yeah. you're right. He would not be the original drummer. Motorhead's another great point, right? We got Lemmy. And if you say, well, who's, who's, who are the original members of Motorhead? Well, you know, Lemmy, Fast Eddie and Phil Taylor. No, because the original configuration had Larry Wallace as the guitarist and Lucas Fox on drums. And then, you know, Lemmy shifted them out pretty quick. Um, Van Halen. David Lee Roth would not be an original member of the band. Michael Anthony would not be an original member. Um, at first, Eddie was actually singing. <laughs> so, you know. he's, a, he's a pretty good singer. And, you know, and, and it's great you bring up Van Halen because Michael Anthony is a, an essential sound, not only his bass playing, mm. but his voice. So Yeah, yeah. And it, it's to the point where we know that they were using tapes for the backing vocals live when you know Wolfgang was playing bass and faking the vocals because that the backup sound was is is um Michael Anthony it's like yeah my have- Michael Anthony is sort of like um Juan Crochier in that you don't have the rat vocal sound without two vocalists one of whom is credited as lead vocals which is yeah. um uh um Percy, Stephen Percy, right? Um, but Stephen Percy's voice can't do the rat sound without the high end. Same thing with Michael Anthony. It's the high end that's yes. being contributed. And he's not quite a lead vocalist, but he's definitely not a not a backup vocalist. Yeah. I mean, it's very recognizable. Like, you know, the yeah. harmonies, you know, like the the or the, the chorus that's like that's that's got the specific sound. Yeah. Um it's it's like um uh it's not metal but um lindsey buckingham and stevie nicks when they sang harmonies i mean a lot of times they're on other people's records because that's one sound you can't get from other singers so it's like um just recognizable you know lindsey buckingham yes he sings lead but it's the two of them together on the choruses that really make that sound yeah so, so I mentioned Dokken, right? Don Dokken's band originally included Juan Crochier and Bobby Blotzer, both of whom are going to go over to Rat. Yep. And Greg Leon. So, you know, if we were to say, what's what's the classic Dokken lineup, we would definitely say George Lynch, Jeff Pills, and Mick Brown. But yeah. none of them are original members in the strict sense. Right. Um, Another thing that's kind of interesting, girls' school, you know, um, massively influential new wave of British heavy metal band. Um, it would include Kim McAuliffe, Kelly Johnson, Annette Williams, and Denise Dufort, but not Jackie Chambers or Tracy Lamb, who were really essential to the the band as well. Um, Metallica. <laughs> Metallica would not include Kirk Hammett right. or Cliff Burton, but would include. Dave Mustaine. <laughs> right. And you know, it's so funny because we heard that when Megadeth came out, we heard about, or I heard about, um, well, you know, he's he's the original guy from Metallica and they had this big beef, but I didn't, yeah. I only knew that from the interviews. I didn't have an album, a Metallica album with Dave Mustaine on it. Well, he was credited in writings uh, for some of the songs on Kill Em All. Was he? Oh, I have to so, go back but, you, but you'd have to like look at the, the songwriting credits. Yeah, I have to go back and look. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it, there was plenty of it in the, the magazines like Circus and Hit Parader because Dave Mustaine was so incredibly angry <laughs> all the time, you know, and and uh, saying that, you know, I mean, his, his emphasis was to have a heavier, faster, better band than Metallica. Right. Which, by the way, that was a controversial thing. I would say that in the long run, he actually pulled that off. I, I think that Metallica and uh, Megadeth are kind of like toe to toe for those first three albums. And then, you know, as Metallica becomes more poppy and and uh, I won't quite say sells out, but, you know, some people would. Uh, Megadeth just keeps chugging ahead. Yeah. And, no, I, I, I agree with that. I think a, a lot of metalheads ended up, you know, saying, well, I mean, you know, Metallica for people in our, uh, in our age range, yeah. for the most part, people I talked to, you know, it was like over with a black album. It was like, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that they came back either. Like, 
Yeah, Jimmy. and well, I mean, if you think about, so there's a bit of a digression, right? The trajectory from Kill 'Em All to Master of Puppets, really, really solid stuff. Not a bad song on the right. album. And then there's, you know, the, the, the unfortunate death of Cliff Burton, the change to, you know, how the, the songwriting is going and the mechanics of the band. They bring in Jason Newstead, who they admit that they treat it as basically like a hired hand. Yep. And they do the Garage Days re-revisited, which is good because it's, you know, Metallica had, had been known for doing um, cool covers of other people's stuff. And it, it brings awareness to these bands. And then they do Injustice for All. And Injustice for All is like continuing in a trajectory that makes sense from Kill 'em All to Master of Puppets. It's getting heavier, harder, harsher. It's sort of like, let's see what thrash metal can actually do. Unfortunately, it was mixed badly, you know, um, but it, it represented sort of the, the end point, you could say, of a musical development. The Black Album is like swinging way over to the other side. You know, it doesn't make sense as something coming on the heels of Injustice for All. Whereas if, if oh. it, I, I'd say if, if they if they'd had just those first three albums and then the black album it would be less of an, there'd still be a, like a, Whoa, what's going on here? Kind of moment. Yeah. But I think it wouldn't have been as incongruous. But, you know, in, in, with a lot of the students I see the black album is kind of, I mean, a lot of them weren't born yet, but yeah, the, the black album, made all the riffs, of the black album, like, you know, hmm. enter Sandman is the, yeah. riff, but yeah. like, you know, being able to play the master of puppets riff was really cool when I was young. Yeah, you play it, you know. Well, but. I mean, I think the song that uh, probably got the most imitation was Fade to Black. Oh, God. Yeah. Right? I mean, that was the, the first huge one. I remember everybody was doing yeah. it at the talent show. <laughs> if they could, they tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, we talked about that. It, it's in a certain way, it's a power ballad. You know, lots of people were, were uh, getting into it. It's, it's about, you know, um, alienation and depression and stuff like that yeah but, but it has the dynamics of a power ballad yeah i mean you know and there's more to be said um uh, you get like a power ballad, like nothing else matters from the black album right that was just, right and you know i remember seeing the video talk about talk about ethos i just saw you know uh they had the you know, um what's his name uh jason newstead had a ponytail glasses and he was reading music in the studio and i said this is like whoever set this up is just not metal and he doesn't read you know it's like they're not yeah yeah like, we to believe that metallica sits there and read you know somebody's written the music out for them to read to do this stuff and i remember being disappointed at that visual that they were trying to come off as like sophisticated musicians you know and there was the black it was a black and white video too right it was like okay yeah yeah kind of i think that's right yeah room. and i remember going what the and just being completely like I can't. And then, but you know, all the people that hated Metallica really liked that album. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's why it was so polarizing. They managed to capture a vast audience share that they'd missed before by basically giving the finger to their hardcore uh, supporters who'd been with them through the entire chain. And not to, not, not to, not to go somewhere totally different, but this is a, a really interesting point about, you know, they had to sit and decide, you know, um, well, I don't know, but, you know, for them to, you're almost contemptuous to your fans then, right? Like, thanks for getting us to this point where we get a, a, a big money album and, yeah. you know, and then now we're just going to like, you know, really cash in and, and have, uh, you know, have somebody come in and uh, we'll, we'll cater to the people you all, that bullied you. Right. So, I mean, you know, we always talk about heavy metal as, you know, you know, we were the loners, but metal understood us. And the all outcasts, sudden, yeah, yeah. They were the outcasts, and all of a sudden, they're catering to the people that bullied us. And there's, a, there's a, there was something broken there as far as like them wanting to be popular. I mean, in our minds, right? Yeah. You know, uh, and I think Maybe we should definitely do a show specifically about case studies like this. Um, I mean, we, you, you and I have talked about this a lot. Is there some sort of like contract between? you know, um, the musicians and the fans. No, there's no explicit contract, but there's definitely a whole set of expectations. Mark has a little clip here. Should they have changed their name from Metallica to Raka? <laughs> yeah, I mean, or, or you know, um, hard rock ensemble or something like that. <laughs> and, 
um, you know, but that's interesting, you know, uh, but if we talk about original members, let's say that Kirk Hammett and James Hetfield weren't part of the Black Album, but, you know, a new Metallica, and then that album came out, I think we would be furious that somebody came in and ruined it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there'd, there'd be a different... You know, and then, you know, but at least we could accept that these softer versions, you know, yeah. they can say they're the first of the Black Album. We want to say that these people are the first of the, you know, Kill Em All era or the, you know. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, the, the original members, I guess they, you know, yeah, they, we could because we could do original members by era, right? Like, you know, uh, there's some bands. I, I mean, like, is it useful to use original in that case is, is the question that we're going to have oh, to get, I, get to it, you know you're right so in other words the well i mean something to point out that that person uh or those people were part of this era like right the, right um, so you know we you can see that there's a lot of problems with this very strict sense of original right because it leaves out some really key players in these these major bands um, there's a couple other problems that come up as well, like bands that split up and then reformed with just a few members. So the Scorpions is a great example of this. The original Scorpions did have um, uh, Rudolf Schenkner, but a bunch of other people. And then it, it breaks up. He joins another band, uh, which Klaus Meine is in. And then um, they're like, well, let's use the Scorpions name but it's really a, a refounded Scorpions band, right? It's not the original, original, it's the new original Scorpions. And, um, you know, Iron Maiden, um, at one point, Steve Harris actually disbanded Iron Maiden so that he could reform it and get, get rid of all these people that he thought were kind of like not very effective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Judas Priest did that. Judas Priest broke up and then reformed. Um, so you could say, well, Al Atkins was the original singer. Yes, of the first Judas Priest, not of the Judas Priest that we actually recognize and, and know. Um, well, that's a good point. The, that's well said. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, I guess, you know, with the Scorpions too, there's the, you know, the, the, the um, you know, like the blackout era. And then yeah. the 70s with Uli John Roth and the music yeah. is very different. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, although there is continuity because, you know, same singer, um, more or less same drummer and bassist in, in, in much of that time. Uh, Real Schechner is still writing all the songs, you know, and this, this, this thing about like bands that split up and reform, it made me think this isn't quite like that. But what should we make of Richie Blackmore effectively taking Ronnie James Dio's band Elf, bringing them in? making rainbow and then saying i'm just keeping ronnie james dio the rest of you are fired <laughs> are they original members you know these elf guys um oh interesting not really right because no. richie blackmore is running the show um but it, it's kind of like reforming a band isn't it yeah i mean i i guess yeah it's uh it's a blunt way to do it <laughs> Yeah, well, nobody ever claimed that Richie Blackmore was a wonderful moral person. So, <laughs> so let's let's talk about another way of thinking about originality. Um, another definition we could use is if you played on the first album, you're an original member, and not an EP, an actual right LP. I mean, this is maybe we should debate this, you know, should should an LP be the criteria or could an EP or even a demo count? I don't know. What do you think, Scott? Like Iron Maiden, the Soundhouse tapes? Um, oh, or does right. it have to be Iron Maiden, the album? I mean, I just, you know, if if the EP turned to be classic or if the EP, you know, had hits on it. Yeah, um, back then, or well, I don't, I don't. Let's not use the word hits because, uh, but like you know, let's say it did really well with fans, and fans hold it in high regard. Yeah, maybe. But if the EP was kind of like, this is the budget we have. You're gonna make this, and then you can shop it around. Okay, um, it depends on the purpose of what the EP was. If it was a budget thing, if it was a, so you can have enough, some material to sell at your shows. If, I, I think you know, it goes down to you know 
was the EP kind of self-produced and self-put out or, and then you signed with capital or what, or whoever. Mm, okay. And then, you know, the, you know, and you're actually inking something like, um, but yeah, I, yeah. I would say what, you know, you brought up something earlier. It's like, well, you know, is it kind of up to the fan? Like if the fans, you know, if the first album was a flop and nobody had it, nobody <laughs> owns it, but the second one with the new people and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh album, are those the people that we want to see in a reunion? Or do we want to see the, 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 the band that. Did yeah. The pop album? That's, that's really interesting because a lot of the first albums are kind of like, we're trying something out. Maybe some of this is going to work. Some of this isn't going to work. Um, the band might have a lot less control over the producing. Like you think about rock a Rolla and Judas Priest being disappointed with the production on it, mm. you know, um, and rock a Rolla. It's, it's a good album. It's not like the number one Judas Priest album ever. It's not like they, you know, established themselves and they never measured up to it after that. I mean, you can say that rock and roll is perhaps it might even be in the bottom half of Judas Priest albums, I think for a lot of fans. Um, whereas, you know, Sad Wings of Destiny, Sin After Sin, you know, they're definitely right moving up. Um, Deep Purple is a great example for this, right? So the, the Mark One lineup does actually three albums together before they bring in Ian Gillen as the singer and Roger Glover as the bassist. And those first three albums, they're okay, but they're not, they're not the Deep Purple that we think of, Deep Purple Mark II. So first album doesn't really work for them that well. Um, Quiet Riot. Okay, so we've got the, those first two only in Japan. Sarzo's actually credited on the second album, even though he didn't play on it. It was Kelly Garney. Oh, and, and that might have been because he was touring and it might have been because Dubrow was by that time just finished with Kelly Garney. <laughs> so well, interesting. Yeah, I mean, by that, well, by that time, well, that would have been 81, 82. He was kind of, Sarzo was kind of bouncing around, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Iron Maiden, uh, the very first album, Dennis Stratton is... Uh, a guitarist who's who's there instead of Adrian Smith, as we'll you know now recognize as, as a really central member of the band. Paul Diano, of course, is is the singer on that first album and the second album and and the EP Made in Japan, which seems to be for again total digression, like almost impossible to find these days. I had it as a kid, Made in Japan, but you I had I had the tape. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I I I, I should look to see. Cause I've wondered about that when that was put out of print. Right. Right. And why, the, and why, I mean, anything can be kept in print, right. Pretty easily. So. Uh, was that, God, that was, um, was that the rainbow show? Is that the, cause it came out in the DVD set, the iron maiden, the early years. DVD. It only had five tracks on it. Um, it was, it was a, an EP that was like yeah. the size of a, a, an LP had some nice, you know, like, art of the concert and stuff like that but i don't remember too well because i haven't i haven't had my hands on it for a long time i think yeah because the the live at the rainbow came the video of that show came out on the box set, the dvd box okay. set years okay. ago and it, um and i mean if it's not the same show it's in the same year yeah but uh it's it, it well, no, it, made, it wouldn't be at the rainbow. I mean, this was this was recorded in in Japan. Japan. That's why it made in Japan. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I mean, yeah. playing off of the Deep Purple uh, right. thing as well. But uh, you know, if you think about um, some of these other bands, would this original member thing work? So with Judas Priest, it kind of works, except for drummers are going to change, right? But nobody. I mean, this is going to sound awful, but. Nobody really goes to Judas Priest and they're like, oh man, I've got to see who the drummer is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, it's Ian Hill and Rob Halford and uh, the guitarists, you know. Well, here's an interesting question. Take a band like Kiss. Okay. Who could, who could have the original members back? Yeah. Now, what At do you think? For a while. I mean, they're getting pretty old. Oh yeah, 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 of course. But, you know, there's been the big fight, you know, the fans want to see Ace, the fan, you know, but... And then Ace likes to stir it up, but they're like, well, he's unreliable. <laughs> um, yeah. But so, but 
um, do Gene and Paul do a really, do they do a great job of getting fans to go along with the, they're the, they're the real kiss, those two, Gene and Paul. And that, you know, all the, like Tommy Thayer is like, this is the band. I mean, they still would sell out anything. So people yeah. are not buying tickets. I mean, I don't see, I don't see Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley ever denying that Peter, Chris and Ace Freely are original members. I think it's more along the lines of like, listen, this, this band just doesn't work well together. Um, when we bring them in, we've tried it out a couple times. We're not, we're not reaching out to those guys, you know? Well, you know, it, it, it came to a head at the rock and roll hall of fame. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that was just, um, the, you know, that this is an issue we should talk about with that because, um, there's a bunch of bands where it was debate, whether you're going to oh. use the person like original members, or you're going right, to have right. the people that were on that album perform. Yeah. And, and kiss comes to mind is, you know, uh, and I didn't, I, I don't remember quotes from that interview. I didn't come equipped with that, but it's, if you think about it, I would think the whoever was in the band for the career that got you into the hall of fame should be in there. Right. So a yeah. original. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think, you know, but then the, I think Gina, it's, Pollard, it's tough to say though, in terms of like, I mean, the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, is itself a hot mess anyway because oh, of the God, way they yeah. handle things and what they're willing to call rock and roll. But put all that aside, who has agency? Who is responsible for a band having the success that they do? I mean, you could say, well, the original members or the people on the first album like set the mold and then it's moving forward from there. Um, but I, I think in, you know, especially if we're talking about bands that have a 40 year or even now 50 year tail, we might say, well, you know, I mean, Kiss was doing okay, really great in the seventies. And then in the, the early eighties, they were kind of foundering a bit. There's some, some good yeah. albums and some, some good songs, but they, they kind of didn't really know what their mark is. And then now with Tommy Thayer, and Eric Carr as really, really long-term um, stand-ins, you know? I mean, they wear the makeup um, well, and they, 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 they have they the persona. Eric Singer, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Eric yeah. Singer. Um, Eric Carr, he was he was a guitarist, right? No, no, he was a drummer. Okay. He passed away, though. That's right, yeah. So, so, you know, from like the late 80s, early 90s onward, I guess you could say these, these are guys who are contributing to KISS being a success, you know? Yeah, but, but, to, but to have, but to not have everybody there. Yeah. Especially, you know, there's the 70s KISS and the 80s KISS. I mean, that's, I mean, that's like a hard line draw with them, coincidentally. Right, right, yeah. We were looking up was what, 1980, 81? That sounds about right. I think 81. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing it <laughs> at Caldor, you know, I remember, <laughs> I remember hearing it played on a boom box because I think it was on the masters of metal cassette collection. Nice. <laughs> right. And, and we'd go on these camping trips and the older kids would um, both, you know, like steal liquor from their dad's liquor cabinets and have like a boom box with the latest metal stuff. And we'd wander around listening to it, you yep. know, sipping a, uh, whatever crappy stuff, brandy, <laughs> slow gin, you name it, you know, that, that, that they were able to, to get their hands on. Um, Mark says, uh, some of what it means for a band to be who it is, is due to the activity of its members. Sometimes it, yeah, this is massive. It seems to come down to such contingent factors to luck. What, what the ancients called fortuna, you know, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, and you could, you could say this about Quiet Riot, they really, and this is where Kevin DeBrow, like, you know, this is where he went off the rails because you had, you had Quiet Riot and Van Halen and a few other bands as well in the seventies in LA, like, you know, everyone is telling them heavy metal is dead. Nobody wants to listen to that crap anymore. Uh, it's punk, it's disco, it's, it's, it's right. soft rock. And they, they kept going ahead with it, playing in the, in the, the clubs and stuff like that. And why did Van Halen succeed and Quiet Riot at first did not succeed at the same time that like, you know, um, you've got the early configurations of Wasp with um, 
uh, sister and circus circus you've got mickey rat playing oh, yeah. and all that why why are some bands succeeding and other bands not um well i mean somebody like ozzy osbourne coming in and saying i like that guitarist i want him for my band and poaching him away you know or the record company screwing you around and saying yeah we're going to release a record it's just only going to be there in japan not in the united states you know right so Kevin Dubrow, Kevin Dubrow, for people who don't know this, became very, very bitter. And he would, in the 1980s, when, when Quiet Riot was at the height of their success, having released Metal Health and then the uh, Condition Critical, which has some really oh, good right. stuff on it, he would get up on stage and then he'd be like bad-mouthing all these other L.A. bands, including Van Halen, Motley Crue, Rat, uh, wasp mm. you know some of the bands that were also big at the time and it turned a lot of people off including his own band members yeah that's um that's interesting and i wonder if later on he ever like looked back and said i was young and stupid that's a good that's something we should dig into yeah because um, i'm wondering if we don't want to assume that well maybe i mean maybe he still feels that way maybe in an interview we could find something more recent where he says yeah you know, yeah you know no i we, we should have been huge those bands you know da, da, da. um well but mark is right a lot of it i mean you can be a hard hard worker oh, tour yeah. all the time and maybe things just don't don't work out you know as we always say you know the, the music business is not a meritocracy at all <laughs> it, yeah. not not yeah. slightly in, in, in fact these days when stuff's on the radio it's paid to be there or it's paid to be in the spotify right. list. i mean you know it's you're, you're, it's going to be it's it's already a hit even if you're not listening to it yeah um, so you know back then of course there was money behind albums and promotions but we payola, did have, yeah we had yeah payola but we had to like end up buying a ticket to the show that's true know? yeah and so you well but, and you and you could you could do things like go around and pass out the flyers right that was something bands were doing you could drum up the business um that's part of why you know, Van Halen bringing in David Lee Roth, although they didn't get along with him at first, brilliant move because that guy could like sell anything. Yeah. And uh, he wouldn't take no for an answer. He'd just keep plowing ahead you know, when other yeah. people would get discouraged. So, but that's all, it's always funny when they interview people, even, even people in movies that act and stuff, it's, uh, you know, well, how did you do it? Well, it was X, Y, and Z. And every time I hear that, it's like, well, it probably wasn't. Yeah. You, know, you, you probably have no idea, you know. And well, it was X, Y, Z and the rest of the alphabet behind them. You know? <laughs> so. I love that. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, I, you know, I said, I, I always think it's like, you know, it could be that 10 years ago, you took a left turn instead of a right turn at a stop sign and you were in an accident, you met someone and, you know, maybe that, there was like yeah. four steps from that that led to it that you you don't even know. I mean, it's it's or sometimes it's just I don't know. Like it, it's unexplainable, but that's it's it's very true that. Well, and and to bring this in a philosophical way, this is something that in ancient philosophy they were really concerned with. They call this fortune, right? To what degree does our happiness and success depend on ourselves or on? fortune this wheel that turns you know and sometimes you're on the good end of it and sometimes you're on the the bottom end of it um and i think there's there's so many bands that we could talk about i mean we could actually do like a whole show on like bands that should have succeeded but what the hell happened to them like a prime example the band riot um if you you know I really strongly suggest that at least for the first three albums, um, Rock City, Narita, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the third album. Um, it's the one that's got Swords and Tequila on it. Those are really, really awesome. And Riot was actually getting written up in Kerrang! as being like an honorary part of the new wave of British heavy metal, even though they're a New York band. Right. What screwed them? Quiet Riot. Quiet Riot coming out, being oh. big, people mixed the two of them up. And oh. that was that was it from there. You know, that and their lead singer leaving 
to become, I, you know, like he moved down to Florida and became like a contractor or something like that, left the music business altogether. Those sort of things. I mean, how do you predict those? You can't. And you can have all of your proverbial ducks in a row and then something like that comes along and just screws you over. <clears throat> or again, you know, Cliff, Cliff Burton dying uh, when a tour bus flips over yep. on tour. I mean, who would have predicted that? Or Randy Rhodes, you know, dying in a plane crash, right? So yeah um but let's, exactly. let's come back oh go ahead no no that was it i was exactly yeah i i agree so let, let's talk about this first album criteria and we we can maybe push that out of the way because here think about the scorpions right if we take the first album then uh michael schenkner is you know one of the original members not uli von roth not matthias jobs not francis buchholz not herman rarebell um so you know those are some pretty important admissions however ufo would not include michael schechner the guitarist who's like associated with their great success uh included and said it would be mick bolton you know on on guitar so you know we have to think about um what happens as bands move out of their debut and become more successful, develop musically as performers, start having personality disagreements and, and things, and eventually attain like a more stable lineup. Um, you know, so Iron Maiden will be a great example for that. And to go back to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier, I don't think that we can extend the criterion for original founding per se into the lineup for the second, third and, and fourth or, you know, whatever album, because we're, we're starting to lose the meaning. So maybe we need a different term. Maybe we have to talk about essential members, classic lineup, like, like uh, Rudy Sarzo was doing. Yeah. I'm a, a, a founding member of the metal health lineup, you know, maybe that's what makes sense to do. I, um, I agree that the, yeah, um, a, a founding member. And then he, he names, well, essentially you can name an era. Yeah. Um, well, and so now this goes to, if we want to try to figure out criteria for this, what would be a classic lineup? Um, I'm going to throw a bunch of things out there and then, then you, you Scott and, and Mark and anybody else think about what else would need to be there. It's got to be stable. Right. So you can't have people coming in, going out and have a classic lineup. Okay. They've got to be able to record and tour successfully. I think it's also important that they produce the catalog that in its in time is going to be solid songs become staple songs and then deep cuts. So like what you were talking about earlier, Scott, you know, setting, setting what people going to concerts are going to want to hear in, in the set list. Like if you go to a Uriah Heap concert and you don't hear Gypsy right. or um, uh, Bird of Prey, maybe as a substitute for Gypsy, something's wrong, right? If you go to uh, uh, a Kiss concert and they don't play anything from the early stuff like Deuce or right uh, um, rock and roll all night. I mean, yeah, I mean you'd be like, what's what's going on here? You know? Yeah, that's one way they could get eight encores. Hold out. With <laughs> so I mean, what do you think else has to go into a stable lineup? Uh, it's got to or I mean a classic lineup. It's got to be stable. They got to be recording and touring successfully. They got to be producing the stuff that's going to be like core catalog, core discography. I mean, what you, what you say about the, the 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 fan recognition thing is a okay. tough one because maybe you can help with a philosoph a philosophical thing here. Let's take a band. We always I always. I love the band, but I always use them as a bad example. Def Leppard. Now, something. Okay, yeah, wrong. yeah, yeah. Now, something's wrong if we don't hear eight songs from Hysteria. Not us, but if you and I go to a Def Leppard show, we want to hear On Through the Night and, and yep. you know, and, and maybe the new album, but like we want to hear High and Dry. We want to hear maybe, you know, and Pyromania. Yeah. And maybe one. So who's the real fan? I mean, you know, it's like. It, if if they went and didn't play anything off of um, hysteria, could I mean that's a dare? Could you could I, if I said to them <laughs> you, you can't play anything from hysteria? What are you going to do? If would that make them nervous? You know, there's another factor here. They're used to doing that. They're used to playing hysteria as like the core of their their repertoire. And they would have to actually probably do a lot of practicing 
for a tour that was going to de-emphasize hysteria. They would have to like bring out some of these, some of these songs they haven't played for years and years and years and um, get good at playing them. And um, well, it's another thing because we consider Phil Collin to be an original member, but he's not, he wasn't yeah. on high and dry. He wasn't on, on through. He, he has, he's not on the classics. He was only on one track on um, Pyromania. Oh, is that true? Yeah. And he, so his area was his first album. So I understand why. Yeah. He, yeah. Why he loves that album because that was the sound that he brought to the band. Yeah. And it's, it's great. It's just, that was an album that when it came out, I was, I was really not happy. Yeah, me either. I was I I was very disappointed with it. Um, I've also seen their recent set lists, and that's exactly what they're still doing: is mostly songs from uh, Hysteria, a few from Pyromania, almost nothing from the earlier period, and then a few songs off of the new album, and that's it. Now, Mark has some good good questions. What about the level of success? Album sales, awards won, popularity. So awards won. I don't, I think that's going to like wind up being something that happens decades down the line, like getting inducted into rock and roll hall, hall of fame or stuff like that. Album sales. That's, that's an interesting one. Cause some of these bands, I remember reading when we were doing the research on the, the Rob Halford and KK Downing thing, uh, reading their books and they never had like the level of album sales that say Iron Maiden had, let alone Metallica had, you know? Yeah. Um, well, so, so I, I, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I think, but see, as metalheads, mm -hmm. we don't put stock in any of that. We don't put like, you know, we didn't hear Iron Maiden on the radio. We didn't hear, we didn't really see them, them on MTV much. It wasn't like the, as metalheads, we kind of agreed in an underground way. Whereas if you take <laughs> pop bands and it's like, yeah. well, you know, so-and-so they're, you know, their best selling album was this, you know, the, you know, that might speak to the, the, the band about what they should play. Like I'm sure hysteria has sold the most. Right? Oh, right. Right. Totally. Yeah. So, but like, you know, they're kind of, and pyromania is probably the second. All right. I got everyone had pyromania when it came yeah. out. You had to have it. Um, but they, you know, they don't, they, they, they play a few from that, that, you know, so, so here's, here's Mark is following up with this and says, aren't these part of what makes metal health so definitive for quiet riot? And I think, yes, that's, that's what put quiet riot in front of everybody. Right. So they did get radio airplay. They did get MTV videos, but I think at that time they had indeed managed to attain a stable lineup one that did have personality conflicts, but which could could manage those tensions for a while until they had to fire Dubrow, you know? Um, and they were producing, I mean, like a, a condition critical, like I mentioned, it's great, great album, but um, I don't think there's as much in their repertoire from that as there is from mental health, you know? Um, and if you, if you think, you know, what are the other great Quiet Riot albums does anything come to mind? Nothing. Those are the two albums. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a great point, Mark, because now we're starting to see, um, I think bands like them and Twisted Sister, they got on the radio at the same Ooh, time. Yeah, and yeah. That, and that's not, um, it's not, it's not common for metal bands, but look what their vocal content was. The 80s was about standing up to the parents that wanted to take <laughs> rock and roll away, right? Right. Yeah, Iron Maiden wasn't singing about that. So, you know, we're not going to take it, you know, the video, you know, throwing the the teacher into the basketball hoop and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. So, you know, and, and of course, the movie Footloose, the Breakfast Club, um, all these movies about... Uh, rebellion. Yeah. Rebellion and um, Twisted Sister and, and, and uh, Quiet Riot were great. I, they really sang about the rebellion thing. And I maybe that's why it made it on the mainstream. <laughs> I mean, you know, because well, of the bands, Deep Purple wasn't singing about like standing up to the parents or, the, you know... Yeah, and Perfect Strangers, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they were more of a like, Great. you know, an older person's band that was talking about like what it was like being rockers in the '70s, or you know, uh, yeah. you know, one too many wasted sunsets. I mean, wonderful things. There's not a bad song on that album. No, I love but, that album. Um, yeah, different, very different content. So if we go to this classic lineup thing, right? Um, Van Halen. Easy, right? It's the the the, the four. Um, 
the two yeah. Van Halen brothers, Michael Anthony, David Lee Roth, that's the classic lineup. Um, Metallica with Cliff Burton. Um, for Judas Priest, it's the, the four and then whatever drummer they have. Um, for Iron Maiden, now here's where it gets interesting. This is where I really want to get Scott's take on this. So Bruce Dickinson very clearly becomes part of the classic lineup replacing Paul Diano. And he can take the Paul Diano era songs and make them his own, you know, yeah. like running free uh, off of Live After Death, probably better than um, Diano singing it on Iron Maiden. Um, Adrian Smith, you know, by the second album, he's already there. He and Dave Murray, like, gel together right in a, in a way that i think uh some of the other two guitar people haven't done you know like we find out you know later on that glenn tipton and kk downing were never really seeing eye to eye in judas priest um now what about so uh, you're, you're willing to say that those are classic lineup players right bruce dickinson and adrian smith uh, i mean yeah although i will say um the first lineup with Diano and um, Dennis Stratton. No, not Dennis Stratton. The drummer. Come on, Scott. Oh, Clive Burr. Clive Burr. I, yeah. I, I love his drumming infinitely more than, I mean, that was a, wow. so, the rhythm section was so great on those two Diano albums. And well, and, all, and uh, uh, number of the beast. He played the, number of the beast. You're yeah. right. That, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's like, um, he wasn't such a big personality, but you know, the, so it's, it's, I love both of them, but you know, one's more of a punk band and one was a completely different thing. So that's what I was going to ask you about is Nico McBrain, a classic Iron Maiden classic lineup of Iron Maiden member. I mean, he's yeah. been with them for a million albums. Yeah. And that's, and that's part of your criteria. Yeah. But and I mean, and, and it includes peace of mind and power slaves. So you know, most of the albums. Yeah. What do you, th should he be considered at this point in time, a member of the classic lineup of iron maiden? Um, that's a really good one. Cause they're, well, I mean, Clive passed away. So, you know, we can't talk about, well, should Clive come back in the band? Right. But, right. Um, no, because the con the contribution to all the albums that were so different than the first couple, you know, like once Diano okay. left, I mean, even Number of the Beast was pretty different, you know, it, we had the, the same drummer. So I, I think the big change is, I think we all respect the, the Diano stuff, but we knew that he couldn't keep that going. We knew we right, could pull right. that off. Um, <laughs> And, uh, well, and apparently he was a raging a-hole too. Um, again, coming from the uh, the Judas Priest stuff, right? Judas Priest was an established band by the time that Iron Maiden is playing with them. And the, the one guy who's starting crap besides their manager is Paul Diano. He's like talking trash, you know, after they've only got one album out, he's talking trash to the members of Judas Priest, you know, I, I, and they, I, and they're to the point where they're like, we're going to beat the crap out of this guy, you know? <laughs> That's, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I just knew, I, I think he, well, he got fired for just using too much, right? He, he was unreliable. Well, he, he got fired for that. He got fired for being kind of a loose cannon, but they all, I mean, it was also clear that they thought in order to move to the next level, we need a better singer. We need somebody yeah. who can project out to these, these uh, massive audiences. And that they were going <clears> to <throat> grow with Diano. They, I mean, you know, they would have, the, Dickinson was he he is far more versatile you know that's it an would, interesting point that you've got there about growing right because maybe there's a tension to between like having a classic really well-defined sound that's reliable but also um being able to grow I mean you look at Iron Maiden for those those early albums so the first one is pretty is pretty raw. Killers is definitely better than Iron Maiden. Oh, yeah. Then Number of the Beast is like even better than that. Peace of Mind. And this is where we get people get into d disputes. I think Peace of Mind is is marginally better than Number of the Beast. And yeah, Power Slave is kind of holding holding constant. But each one is a different kind of sound and different kind of album. You know. And you have to remember that the mindset back then was you were in it for the long long haul because record companies would invest right in six albums before you made it now it's um 
you know, now you're, you know, you make your statement now because you'll be gone tomorrow. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, there, there was a different mindset back then. So it makes sense that, you know, um, if Steve Harris is coming up with the mm. more progressive kind of stuff that he's thinking of. Um, this is an interesting side point from, from Mark. Um, he's read that Deanna was later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I think undiagnosed mental health concerns in musicians this is an interesting topic to it consider. Is, yeah. Obviously ties in with drug abuse, but that's another one of those factors of fate. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, a lot of these things were just not being recognized at the time. You were just an unreliable a-hole, you know? Um, well, that's a great point because you see all the guys at Deep Purple talking about Tommy Bolin, who was a guitarist. Oh, for a while. yeah. And he died what a tragic 25. story. Yeah. And um, and they said, you know, look, you know, in his defense back then, we didn't know. You know, back then it was all fun and games and we didn't really, you know, there somebody were, OD'd and, you know, and then we'd move on. Then right? we'd move on. It was just, you know, um, uh, I guess it wasn't like, you know, addiction and all this stuff wasn't as recognized at the time. Or it was, you know, it was part of the, I mean, look. like Or it was, was romanticized. It was romanticized because yeah. look, they were deep <clears throat> purple. If you, if you go to the early 70s, um, you know, they had nothing to look back on. I mean, Beatles, 64, Ed Sullivan. Yeah. First rock band. Well, Jimi Hendrix. And Jimi Hendrix and, yeah. and uh, the 27 Club, you know, all, all three of them, uh, Janis Joplin, Hendrix, yeah. and um, uh, Jim Morrison. And yeah, but then you come up with these bands and it was kind of like, you hear these stories that the one um, where Tommy Bowen, they fly out to do Taste the Band, and he went out and got trashed and met these women in Germany and brought them back and then saw these pills on the board, just took them all. Oh, and then geez. after he took them, he goes, oh, what was that? And they go, well, you're not going to die, but you're going to sleep for a long time because they're all sleeping pills they were supposed to take to get rest before recording. Wow. And so, um, yeah, I guess that, but it's a good point about um, the mark that you make about, uh, uh, about diagnosing uh, mental illness. Yeah, you know, it's I don't know. And managing it, you know, I mean, you, yeah. you can you can still be successful, but but it requires attentiveness and like laying down limits, <clears throat> which I don't think a lot of people were, were very interested in or good at back then. You know, that's yeah. And um, that's that, that's that is a great point, because like I said, you know, you have to realize the mindset is, you know, we need somebody more versatile. We can't stay in this punk. I'm starting to, you know, like uh mm. Steve Harris is starting to write more epic songs that aren't three minute punk songs. He's starting to write yeah. longer tunes that involve more of a, uh, less of a movements punk. and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I think that was a, a wise choice, but you know, that wouldn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people these days, if they wanted to kind of be torn, it's just kind of like, what's going to get us now. It's going to get us more likes and more follows or whatever, yeah. where it's not um, we're considering these things. Shifting back to like the um, classic lineup idea uh, and talking about essential members and, and things like that. I wonder if we can't, at least with some bands, talk about multiple eras. And I think this is something you were getting at earlier, Scott. So like Black Sabbath is one that I have in mind. There is really two classic Black Sabbath eras. There's the one with Ozzy Osbourne that runs basically seven years or so um it's got bill ward on drums for all of that actually singing one of the songs on on one of the the last albums uh never say die because ozzy wouldn't sing it and then um <laughs> you've got the dio era right which is it's pretty short you know um mob rules um uh heaven and hell and then oh, yeah. there's there's a reunion later on that with the humanizer um, and Ozzy brings in Cozy Powell on drums, right? So Ward is replaced, but you do have continuity because it's Yomi and Butler in those. And I think we, we could talk about those as being two classic lineups because they reform later, right? They're, they're willing right. to do that. Um, Ian Gillen, just there for one album, definitely not like a classic essential member, although it's a, it's a great album, I think, um, Born Again. Um, Glenn Hughes, um, also there, Tony Martin, who doesn't yep. get enough love, I think. Um, but, but it's really only the Ozzy and the Dio era that could be considered the classic 
lineup, I think, um, for, de- for, cl- for, for quiet riot, it's definitely the metal health era. Yeah. Um, for tank, <clears throat> you know, formed by algae ward originally, he's got these two guys, the Brobs brothers. And so the early tank is a trio. And then for honor and blood, he brings in two guitarists, Cliff Evans and Mick Tucker, which is the classic lineup. Um, I, I kind of think they both are in part because there's currently two tanks out there, Algie Ward by himself in his studio recording. And then the tank that's currently touring is Cliff Evans, Mick Tucker, and whoever else they get to, uh, to be with them. Um, and they, they, you know, they play the classic era stuff. Honor was honor, or yeah, honor was, I think the fourth album, for tank so it's it's pretty early in their career you know um another thing that i think we want to consider is how do people become essential members of the band so you know like bruce dickinson becomes an essential member because he auditions and starts singing on albums and does the old stuff but does a lot of the new stuff yep um, the Scorpions, Francis Buchholz, Herman Rarebell, I would say that they are essential members of the band, at least the Scorpions that we know right. and love, um, because they're they're playing on all the essential 70s and 80s stuff. Um, girls' School, there's kind of a cool story with that. So the current guitarist is Jackie Chambers, and she's been the guitarist for a while. And she was not just replacing Kelly Johnson. She was trained and mentored by Kelly Johnson and Chris uh, Bonacci, the other person who'd been a lead guitarist, so that she could replace them in the band because Kelly Johnson was dying of cancer. She had um, six years of therapy and treatment and, um, she actually shared a flat in London with Kelly Johnson, Chambers and, and Johnson. And so this is like a deliberate decision. We need somebody. So imagine that like um, Steve Harris and Iron Maiden um, found out that he's, he's got cancer and he's going to die in five years and he wants the band to go on. And then he finds a, you know, maybe 20 something bassist who's kind of like him in certain respects. And he's like, I'm going to make you into not a clone of me, but somebody who clearly represents my influence. That's essentially what girls school did. You know, that's, you know, I can't imagine. I mean, I would, I would, I would say for Steve Harris, that's a tough one because you, there's only one Steve Harris. You can't No, you could, you you could, you know? um, Yeah. Well, I find that interesting with the girls school because I, I had heard you tell me that before. And I'm thinking, did this person not play guitar very much? No, no, she played guitar, um, but she just was not at the level that um, oh, I see. girl school wanted her. And so they were like, we're investing in you. Gotcha. Yeah, because like, you know, basically the records would tell you how to play. But mm. um, if, if she wasn't on the level to pick out what was actually going on on the records, um, then that make that would make sense, you know. There's that, and she's also got to be... Um, one of the front people in concert. Right. Well, that's true. So, yeah. so there, there's other aspects, I guess you could say, of the uh, performance that are that are required. Um, here's another question for you. Going back to Kiss. Um, has Tommy Thayer, maybe he's not a classic Kiss era person, right? Has he become an essential member of the band? You know, Tommy Thayer, does, you. you know, he's the only one that, um, he's the one that, comes closest to ace right bruce Kulik right, didn't, right didn't have a he wasn't there to imitate ace although he did some of the solo the classic solos yeah we didn't mind if he didn't sound like ace because it was the the 80s era of it right um yeah uh vinnie vincent we you know he was the he didn't sound anything he was a totally ace. different thing yeah totally different thing so tommy thayer is um you know he wears the he, he wears the ace makeup right right yeah and yeah. like, you know, for everybody else, they had their own makeup. So he, he's, he's essentially, you know. So can you be essential if you're playing somebody? Yeah, I know. I you know, yeah. you no, know, because you, you could find somebody else to play ace. Ace is the essential. If you're imitating ace, if you're trying to be ace, you're trying to imitate the essential. Yeah. 
I, I so think this goes I, back to the issue of mimesis that we, we were exploring in previous episodes and tribute bands and things like that. Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, the point of it, he's essentially doing a, a tribute part in the real band. It's yeah. like, whereas like Bruce, Bruce Kulik was doing himself in the band. He was, he was bringing his thing to the table and he was contributing to kiss in his way of how he sounded, how he looked. Um, okay. And there was a reason why they got him in the band. So, but he was like nothing. He didn't look anything like Ace. He didn't sound anything like Ace. And uh, now, now to have, it's like, well, we can't have the real Ace. Will you suit up and, you know, wear the Ace makeup and, you know, play the Les Pauls and like play the, yeah, yeah. cause he's the only one that did everybody like what, what's his name was a big, well, I'm sure they all played Les Paul sometimes, but uh, what's his name was a uh, Kulik was a big Kramer guy in that all on those records. You okay. know, he's playing Kramer guitars, the, the you know the hockey stick headstock ones, and the the eighties version. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, let me let me throw one more thing on the table. What about bands that? I've been around for a long time and they've got a later lasting lineup, the one that's currently touring and it's been around for like decades. Uh, would you say that some of those members are now like absolutely essential members? So I'm thinking, for example, of Uriah Heep, where you got Mick Box on guitar, who's a great guitarist and he's, you know, a great band leader. And then you've got um, like Bernie Shaw, on on vocals and Phil Lanzan on on keyboards and they have been with the band since the 80s. I mean, Uriah Heep um, gets going in the late 60s, uh, starts putting out albums in the 70s, and you know, interesting repertoire. Some of the original members are dead. Um, Lee Kerslake was the longest drummer. Trevor Boulder was the longest bassist, um, but Russell Gilbrook has been on drums since. 2007 so you know 15 years dave rimmer on bass a little bit more recently 2013 but it's close to a decade are these essential members i mean i might say dave rimmer on bass maybe not but bernie shaw as the singer he's not an original singer of, of, of uriah heap but he has been with them since the 80s so i don't know what do you think yeah i mean um you know what we have to like include in the variables is, you know, all these bands say, we didn't know this was going to last more than five years. And now right. you are 40, 45 years <laughs> later, you know, um, uh, people retire. Um, so I guess the question is, do we want the bands to go on or not? So is it well, a sense, like with your eye heap? Oh, wait. Yeah. Um, Mark's got some great follow-ups that, that feed into that. Would you rather watch a 70 something year old version of the original band struggling on stage or a younger, more energetic tribute version who can perform the songs closer to their original technical demands? Well, interesting. Um, and this is going to become more and more of a pressing problem as these bands that are currently like, you know, members are in their 60s, early 70s, as they move into their 80s. You know, like say Judas Priest, for example, right? Or or Kiss or Iron Maiden, who's a little bit younger than right uh, on the whole than Judas Priest or Kiss. But I mean, this is going to become a pressing problem in the current current decades. There's gonna there's gonna come a time when um, Adrian Smith and Dave Murray can't do their solos or the stuff the way they're used to. We talked about this with with certain singers, right? Um, who basically can't like not only can they not hit the the notes they also have lost the phrasing you know this is going to happen to everybody sooner or later so so i would might, rather watch i would rather well so like i saw queen and what's he is he, he is brian may in his 70s I, yeah he has to be and I, there's I, like I, him I just hitting a chord is 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 an experience and he and he's he sounds wonderful you know i would say there's a time to hang it up yeah you know um and, you know, I don't want to see what's well, like the whole thing we talked about, like, you know, you know, Kiss is going to license it. So there's an official Kiss tribute band. I don't want to see that. I don't want to yeah. see that because, you know, um, that's not, you know, and, and and sadly, it's like, I don't know how it is around the rest of the country. But here, all the, the, the old theaters that have like, you know, have dance and theater and music they're completely booked with tribute bands. Oh, really? And no, it's not like that here in the Midwest. Um, that's interesting to hear about the 
Boston area. Yeah. So, tri- so tribute bands. And I, I say to these people, like, just, just close this theater. You're not this, there's no art going on here. No, this is what pays the bills. And then, you know, they, you know, and that's, you know, I guess the public has spoken that, you know, they won't pay. I've, I've done some shows in the theaters and 50 tickets out of 2000, but then they get like a, you know, a pretty bad Tom Petty tribute band, but people just want to sing along. And I, yeah, yeah. I don't understand it. You know, I don't understand it. And it's, a, I don't know if it's a cultural thing that's going on right now. So I definitely would rather that see the 70 year old or, you know, it's time to call it a day you know, and, you know, that's what it is. And we have records, we have the live DVDs from that era or the, and, you know, it, it can't go on, you know, people yeah, die, yeah. And people eventually die. So and I wouldn't like to see, um, you, because nobody's going to sound just like Brian May, even if they get somebody that's got the close thing, it's not Brian May. And there's other, there's other great unique artists, but those are what the records are for. You know, they, they capture those moments in time and we can put them on our turntable, so to speak, anytime we want. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like we're not going to hear Debussy perform his pieces on piano ever again. He's <laughs> dead. But, um, yeah. but like, that's a different thing because, you know, there was a separation between the composer and the performer in that genre, so to speak. Well, maybe like, you know, somebody who'd be comparable would be Eric Satie, right? Because I think he did perform some of his piano pieces. Right. But, you know, he's gone. Yeah. So uh, Art and Age of Mechanical. Yeah. I mean. Well, so that's a reference yeah. to the title by uh, Walter Benjamin, an essay that gets brought up an awful lot. Ironically, this is the essay is from almost, a, I think, a century ago. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, we're I think that we're always now like in our lifetime in an age of mechanical reproduction but it doesn't have to be merely mechanical right can there still be some soul to the music that you can hear through the the um mass-produced copies you know that we call an album yeah definitely so there's always this tension um in it but these are <clears throat> there's a lot of great topics here that we'll, we'll probably have to explore in, in uh, future yeah. time. So we you know to to sum it up, we've got a couple different versions of being original, none of which are particularly helpful. And it seems like more we have to talk about like classic lineups. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we want, if we're thinking about like musical ability and producing something that's lasting. Um, it's not, you know, I mean, Lonesome Crow is an interesting album. That's not who the Scorpions really are, or even really were. Um, you know, uh, now Scott, you're, you, you brought up the blackout era, blackout, absolutely central album, but I would say taken by forces too, you know, yeah, or, or in trance and then love it for sting. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll close on something rather controversial. I'll say Love at First Sting was really the last great Scorpions album. <laughs> uh, well, Savage Amusement was for me was sort of like Def Leppard's Hysteria. I get that. Although the songs are fantastic on Savage Amusement. I love the songs, you know. Um, but yeah, I know. I mean, when I got it, it was... It was weird because, you know, I went, you and I both went to bed to Worldwide Live every night, right? That was like, oh, I I actually had something different. I had uh, a 45 minute tape, right? Because back then everything was, you know, like the 30 minute tapes and the 45 minute tapes. And the 30 minute tapes were not long enough to put a full album on usually. So you'd you'd get yourself, you'd, you'd pay the extra money. And I had Blackout on one side and Love at First Sting on the other. And I, I had a, I had a, a, boom box that had the special tape player that when you got to the end of a tape it would start reverse yeah exactly and so it would play both sides until i turned it off and there was something about the scorpions compositions in all that stuff even on the heavy songs that i i just found they were sort of like lullabies you know i i love those albums i love those albums and yeah um i it's so funny savage amusement fantastic songs i love the songs on that album i know what you mean the production was like ah. you know it's like it was kind of a shock um it was kind of like that so uh, it was kind of like uh, with led zeppelin the um i love houses of the holy oh i uh, mark um i'm sorry let's see before bed oh, oh yeah yeah me too 
in mine, Houses of the Holy, yeah, amazing. We'll have to do a different topic another time. Led Zeppelin, to me, got better by the album. You know, uh, a lot mm. of people would like, know the first record, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, if I want to be like a jerk, uh, heavy metal ASMR, nice. Yeah. I mean, actually, that, that that's a great observation that though, is a great kind, observation. Of, kind of close on that. You know, with a lot of these bands, you kind of should expect them to get better, at least maybe reach a peak or something like that. Like, you know, think about Accept, for example. Um, their first couple albums, they're not they're not bad. There's actually some real good songs on there, but they're not Restless and Wild or um, Balls to the Wall, you know, or Metal Heart. That's sort of the... the yeah for the early except, I mean, you could talk about, well, what about their later stuff? Like, you know, Stalingrad and all that with uh, Mark Tornillo as the, the singer and people like that. Eh, yeah. That there's something to that, but, but the early stuff, there's definitely like a cresting that goes up. Um, very few bands come out with like their absolutely best stuff on their first album. I would say. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. And you know, like, you know, with, um, with Led Zeppelin, I mean, it got better and better. Physical Graffiti is infinitely better than Zeppelin too. You know, um, I love mm. Presence. I like, you know, as Led Zeppelin. But yeah, I just, you know, they became songwriters. The songs became great. As first, it was just blues covers. Yeah. I mean, Deep Purple, again, is a great example of that. Those first three albums, oh, there's some things that are kind of fun on that, but it's, it's not Mark II Deep Purple, which is like, you know, really, really solid. Something we should pay attention to when John Bonham died, Led Zeppelin died. Yeah. Like, you know, that's an interesting thing. I, I, I'm like, who are you going to, John Bonham's the greatest, one of the greatest in history. And who are you going to replace John Bonham with? It wasn't just the fact that you can't replace him. It was also the fact that Robert Plant um, was grieving. Yeah. And didn't want to continue on with, with the, the stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm glad. So, so these these kind of random effects, you could say, right? That that occur. Yeah, I mean, and Jimmy Page had a cool solo album, and so did yeah. Robert Plant, and they continued. It just wasn't Led Zeppelin, which is fine. Right. Yeah, and maybe you know, I'll I'll say this, and then then we should probably wrap up. But I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about it. Maybe we shouldn't expect of bands that they have to like keep producing album after album after album. If they if they manage to produce six really, really good albums, maybe that's you know as much as one can expect, you know. I mean, there are some bands that have consistently produced lots and lots of great albums, but six already is like astronomical as far as achievement. And you start to hear it in a lot of the albums, like, you know, when we re revisit, it's like, well, this is, why did you bother doing this record? The fire is gone. You know, you just did it to do it and you're not going to yeah. play anything from it. And, you know, where's, where's the songwriting or where's the, and um, some of them have been really good. Like I, I loved last time the you know, talk about the Uriah Heat album. I like a lot. Yeah. You know, I thought they did a great job on it and I don't think they phoned it in, but so many bands do. And it's like, don't do that. We, we want to remember liking you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mark says, I think dropping one good album that shifts the genre's landscape in a significant way is enough to qualify. Yeah. Or do you think that's more indicative of fortune? I would say both. Um, I mean, being able to shift a landscape really is being in the right place at the right time. Um, but I think there are some albums like that, you know, for better or for worse, because hysteria is one that, you know, it changed. The That's direction true. Of it. And, you know, I don't, you know, these days I don't hate the album. I appreciate the album, but I will put high and dry on the turntable first. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, uh, uh, on, on through the night. Yeah. 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 Those are, those are both great. Love well, we should, we should probably wrap up. Um, we're already going a little bit over time here, but great discussion and, yeah. uh, thanks for the questions. And I think we've kind of, you know, reached a consensus on this topic. Rudy Sarzo is certainly has the right to call himself an original member in the, in the qualified sense, which probably is more important than being, uh, a strictly speaking original member right. of the band. And I think that, that, that applies to a lot of people, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's good. It's good. We got into all the different examples. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll see you next time.
Awesome. Yeah. Take care.